So welcome everybody, this is Robin Harford from eatweeds.co.uk and I'm absolutely delighted to have Marcy Lee Mayer and I discovered Marcy by surfing the web and looking at ted.com, one of my favourite places and I found a video of her talking about edible acorns and using acorns as food. Marcy, tell us a little bit about how on earth did you get into one, ending up on a Greek island, and two, getting involved in acorns. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here, Robin, um, and great to connect with other like-minded people. Um, I came to Greece in 1984 when I was 21 years old. Uh, I was on a, a short break from, from university, and I never went back. It's been 35 years now in Greece. I've, I've got involved in all kinds of things. I had a restaurant for 10 years. I was in Athens for 17 years. Um, and I came to live on the island of Kea, which is not far from the mainland, um, not far from Athens. I came here, uh, like most people do in the beginning, as a weekender with some friends. And I discovered uh, this, this oak forest on the island, which is very unusual for Greece. Uh, they're not oaks like we think of oaks. They're not terribly large or grand, but uh, it, it was autumn when I first came to the island, and the uh, trees were in full bloom, and the acorns are absolutely enormous. They're anywhere from 25 to 45 grams. Wow. So, yes, and it was a year when the acorns were rolling rolling around, you know, the tires of the cars. So this touched off a... Um, a, a childhood memory of mine that uh, I had completely forgotten, but in fourth grade, growing up in Northern California, we learned about traditional foods from the Native Americans in our area, and acorn was, was their staple food, and that was always something that fascinated me as a kid. I grew up under two very large oak trees. So I started experimenting, and that's how this all started. That's extraordinary. So I fielded some questions to some customers who bought my oak notebook and we got an awful lot back actually more than I imagined so we're just going to work our way through these questions there's about 30 of them and they come they cover from absolute beginners who don't know anything but really want to know something and uh, right up to some quite experienced or very experienced experimental foragers so let me just start the questions for you Marcy um, sure. We've got one from Tracy, and it's ob it's a bit of a kind of obvious one. But are acorns really edible, and why do people say they aren't? What's the myth and the fear around acorn eating? Well, it's funny because it isn't as obvious as, as you would think it would be. A lot of us were told as children that acorns are somehow toxic. Um, I've heard that from many, many English people, um, that they were told that. Um, I, I, I put a lot of thought into it. I think um, it was probably the poorest and the most desperate of uh, uh, humans that um, ate acorns uh, after other crops were, were cultivated. So acorns were part of our diets. Acorns were our sta a staple diet for human beings in many areas of the world. But then as they began cultivating other crops, uh, the acorn was less uh, predominant, and it is labor-intensive. And I think somehow it got a stigma as being a poor person's food, because there's no doubt that the last few people and communities that ate acorns regularly were the poorest. That, together with the fact that acorns were always, or at some point, were substituted as human food, and they were given to, to livestock, to, mostly to pigs. And so they got a stigma as being somehow pig food, you know, only fit for pigs is an expression. That's a, pretty much all I can come up with. I mean, yeah, they just slowly but surely uh, were there. A stigma was attached to eating acorns. And then that transferred into being thought of that, that they were toxic. I've got a question from Mary. She says, can Irish and English oak acorns be used in the same way? So in effect, basically, to generalise that question, can all oak, oak acorns be used in the same right. way? Right, yes. Um, I certainly haven't experimented with all acorns, but I have experimented with, uh, with many different kinds. There are 
more than 500 species of oak. And yes, they're all edible as long as the tannins are leached down to a level which isn't harmful. The tannins, if they're if they're too high, if they're left too high, of course they're going to be harmful to the kidneys. Um, so it's you know that that is a question that can lead to all kinds of places. But the short answer is yes, all acorns can be eaten now because it's a very new field. Um, it will require people in different areas with different trees and different acorns to do their own experimentation and see what works best. I've been fortunate enough to work in the Mediterranean where the weather is excellent and uh, and I'm sure that the, the um, techniques that I've come up with are not applicable 100% to other places. So it's, it's still an area that a lot of research is going to be needed. Yeah, no, I think I think one of the things and the beauty and the joys of the, the current kind of wild food movement is that it is an experiment and it's an ongoing experiment. It is a rediscovering of the ways that we might have eaten wild plants in the past. And I do encourage anyone who's listening to this show to to do what Marcy says. Just we know that all the acorns are edible, all the oaks acorns are edible. So start playing. Now, some of them will have high tanning content. Some will have low tanning content. I know that, I think, not that I know, I, I've been told that the holm oak, the holly oak, the evergreen oak in Britain has the lowest tanning content, but I don't know about that. Do you know anything about that, Marcy? Well, a word about tannin. Um, there's a lot of, there's quite a lot of, there are many, facts that I, well, so-called facts that I found on the internet, which are absolutely across the board wrong. Yeah. Uh, the white oak, we know that oak, oaks are divided into two groups of white oaks and red or black oaks. And white oaks have generally lower tannin contents than red oaks. So they have been, it has been assumed, but by people who haven't actually been on the ground experimenting, that white oaks, therefore, acorns would be much easier to um, to get detannize, if you will, to leach than red acorns. Um, that isn't so because white acorns also have a, an enzyme that red acorns don't have, which essentially locks the tannins in. So even though you have higher levels in the red acorns, you end up being able to leach them out much more quickly. So my experience, my my personal experience has been that red acorns I can get leached and ready to go in, within three or four days in in vats at the most, and white acorns can take often two or three weeks. So again, it's I I'm so glad that you said that experiment play. It's all about that. I mean, it's all about just uh, seeing what you can do with something that has been forgotten for a long time. But we know you're not going to get hurt as long as you get those acorns tasting to the point where where the tannin isn't so much that it makes your lips pucker. Another question from Mario and a concern of many, many people over, certainly over here, is oaks are slow growing and if humans were to start eating them, then the native population might be wiped out. What do you advise to prevent this, specifically in the context of community gathering and harvesting? How do you prevent, you know, I mean, the the concept of the kind of the pillager forager of stripping everything is kind of a myth. There is no doubt there are certain individuals that do that because they see dollar signs. But 99% of people that I know are respectful. But it's a good question because it's one that we are as foragers challenged by people who just want us to eat food from the supermarket. Absolutely. No, I think it's it's very important for anybody who's involved in foraging or, or harvesting of tree crops to be very aware of, of all the other uh, species that depend on these acorns as well as, as us if we, if we start eating them more regularly. So that would involve either some kind of replanting program, obviously not stripping the trees. It's not as much of a problem with acorns as you would think because we leave so many acorns at the tree um, that we deem inappropriate for flower, but those are perfectly viable as, uh, you know, as seed, those will become seedlings. The other thing that happens is we have an ongoing compost pile 
with uh, reject acorns, reject acorn caps, and those uh, sprout saplings, which could be easily replanted. We do replant some of them, but a program could be, so you could be just directly putting acorns back into the ground. Um, here, it's, it's, this isn't really a concept I've had to deal with because I'm working in an ancient oak forest, which uh, has about 200,000 trees. And I really only need about 200 individuals for, for the business that I've built around acorn flower. So it's, there's really no, no fear of, of that here. I can understand, though, in urban or suburban or, you know, areas, um, you'd have to be particularly careful to make sure that there, there are plenty of acorns left for saplings. Yeah, so that kind of what pops into my mind when, when I hear you say that is that actually acorns could actually become a potential cottage industry for rural communities that are basically failing <laughs> well, that's the idea it's not you know nobody's going to get rich from from gathering acorns and processing them but it can supplement your cupboard and it can supplement your income in some way and i think the way to go is that you know community um small community cottage industries exactly it's i can't even imagine how big big food could get involved in acorn processing it's far too it's far too labor intensive yeah but, yeah, yeah. A question here from Stephanie, who is a soap maker, and she says, can the oil extracted from, a well, firstly, can oil be extracted from acorns? And secondly, if so, can that oil be used in soap making? Because she says that many soap making staples have a huge carbon footprint associated with them. Okay, uh, I'm not a soap maker, so I can't really speak too much specifically to soap making. Um, acorns do have oil, uh, different species have, have different levels. They're not, not very high, six, 7%. You'll read much higher in some literature online, but it's so far I haven't found that. Um, theoretically and experimentally, I have extracted oil, but living in Greece in a place so inundated with uh, excellent quality olive oil. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I decided that, you know, there was no reason for me really to try to extract oil on a large basis from acorns. Um, and also, I like to leave the oil in as much as I can in the acorn flour I'm making because it just makes it more nutritious and more tasty. But it's not very high in the first place. It's only about six or seven percent. I think that for soap making, it would be very interesting to use the caps or the shells ground up as an exfoliant in the soap, and then you would get some of the goodness of the acorn, um, but without, yeah, without really relying on the oil. Yeah, great. Actually, that springs to mind because, like you said, you have you have olive oil dripping everywhere, whereas in Britain, if the plane stopped flying tomorrow, if fuel failed and there was nothing yeah the we need to be looking for alternative food oils right. i mean acorns obviously very low beech nut huge amounts of oil in there anyway that's a whole other probably discussion. yeah you probably need to go towards seed in that case but yeah that is a whole other bucket <laughs> <laughs> person called volk and his daughter have two questions can acorns be considered a sweet food i see mainly medicinal and savory uses are they best in sweet or savoury food? Would they go well in with meringues, glazed nuts on festive cake treats, dairy delights, etc.? And then Volk's daughter, who I assume is quite young, asks the question, is it possible to make acorn soup? So is it a sweet food or savoury and can you make soup with it? Well, um, acorn can be used in sweets and in savouries. I personally used them in sweets in the beginning much more and before I found savory uses. But now I use them to make falafel and uh, little meatballs. And I'll, I, I have a, I, I, we'll talk about that later. I've written a book called Eating Eggcorns. And I've included 70 recipes in the book. And um, only about a quarter of them are for sweets. Most of them are savory. And Can I, can I just quickly interject there? Yes. Regarding Marcy's book, we actually have a, 
a bit of a special offer for you with free posting. So don't just shoot off if you're listening to this and head to Amazon. We're going to be providing a special offer for anyone who would like to pick up Marcy's book and some of her acorn flower. Sorry, Marcy, I interrupted you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, Volk's daughter, sorry, don't know your name. There are acorns are great in soup. I've got three recipes in my book. I've got an acorn barley stew, an acorn lentil soup, and an acorn split pea curry soup. Um, I use acorns um, fresh when during harvest time. I, I have acorn chips frozen in the freezer that I that I pull out and add into soups uh, often. And uh, acorn flour makes a fabulous thickener. It's a substitute to corn flour. It's a lot healthier and it's a lot tastier. So the the sky's the limit as far as possibilities of using acorn flour. There's I think it's important for people to realize that acorn it's not about making acorn flour behave like wheat flour. You have to figure out what it'll do on its own. That's kind of been my approach to it. It, it is gluten-free, so that that means it won't rise the way wheat flour will. So it has a whole, a, a whole bunch of – has many qualities, but they're, they're very different than wheat flour. Yeah, I've been I, – um, I told a friend of mine who's a big food prepper and about you and – your flour and he he shot me over a recipe for his variant and and i then said would you reckon i can make use acorn flour with this and he went well i don't think this will work um so i completely ignored him (laughs) he's one of my best friends so i'm allowed to say that um and and i started experimenting with acorn and what did i use acorn and flaxseed literally Uh just that with a bit of oil and salt Mm-hmm. And I've ended up making these extraordinary crackers. I'm still experimenting. I'm not quite there yet. But they were good. one because they don't use wheat flour. I mean, I I I'm completely off off grains. I don't need any grains. Not because I'm celiac or anything, but just because I'm quite interested how grain culture came about when nomadic. Just to be very clear, nomadic hunter gatherers became pastoralists settled down and then we got agriculture so you know grains are part of the agricultural civilization prior to that we would have necked a few little seeds a few bits of wild wheat or oats that we saw around but we certainly wouldn't have eaten them in the quantity we are eating them now so your flour is extraordinary i have to say um and i i made a, a venison slow cooked venison casserole the other day and i heaved in lots of the acorn flour and it just produced this delicious sauce i mean absolutely i I mean you imagine you know venison and acorns i mean i can just imagine i mean those things are made to be together acorn (laughs) and mushroom as well so all the forest foods go so well yeah but also many other things i make it an acorn flax cracker as well i think i've got the recipe in the book and um it's yeah absolutely wheat free Mm. Uh, some of my recipes do have wheat flour. They're a combination because uh, I I haven't set out to write a, a 100% vegan or 100% acorn cookbook. Acorn, I'm trying to, I tried to include a lot of recipes that would be accessible to many different people. I'm sure the audience here are, are you know, a little bit more forward thinking and have a lot more information than, say, the, the, the general uh, audience does. But uh, the spine cookbook. So I'm trying to add recipes that also somebody who's not 100% committed to 100% acorn would also be able to to try. Yeah, no, and I, and for me, I encourage not only on my courses but on my Eat Weed site with recipes. I used to up until quite recently just put suggested instructions which and the word is suggested. These are not rules. These are a template that you can you can either make exactly as the recipe says or you can expand from and play with and you said that at the beginning it's about experimenting and playing Mm -hmm. so it's great to have recipes because they are a starting point but don't be a slave to them you know just just play exactly the the girl that edited my book she said you know i've never seen a recipe book so straightforward and so simple and it's not very verbose and it's like yeah well you know you just want to get to it you know you just want to get to the, an idea that look this is i this is how i use it and it's really tasty but you know you're free to do something else if that's what you've got in your cupboard yeah absolutely 
Great. Okay, onwards to the next one. Question from Sam. What would your top tips be for someone wanting to, tr to try cooking with acorns for the first time? That's a great question. And that gets back to um, I, you want to experiment with acorns and see what they'll do. Now, what I found is that they do not have gluten, but they do gel nicely. So if you just take a couple tablespoons of acorn flour with some juice and you simmer that for a few minutes and then you pour it into um, uh, some kind of mold and you put it in the fridge, you get a really nice smooth jelly. Now you don't get that with wheat flour, you just get paste with wheat flour if you did the same thing. So it behaves very, very differently. So I would say experiment. Um, I think crepes are a first great uh, thing to do with acorns. If you get some acorn flour you or make some acorn flour yourself, uh, just substitute it 100% in your favorite crepe recipe with some eggs and some milk if you're not a vegan. And um, and it's they make sort of a pumpernickel colored crepe, very dark brown, but very, very tasty and very automatic. If you are a vegan, I actually, on my on my acorn flour, I have included a very simple, simple vegan um, crepe recipe, which just makes kind of a crispy uh, crepe that you can wrap anything in. Yeah, I was in uh, India in January and ate from a kind of street food vendor and they had a, a flat bread that didn't have wheat in and and i have to say when i was experimenting with the flour and the flaxseed it it reminded me of it i can't for the life of me remember the name of the bread because it certainly it, i think it might have been region specific because we certainly don't normally get it over here um but i'll try and dig out the recipe for it and put it up on eat weeds in conjunction with your flour so people can play but that mm -hmm. worked really well and like you said it it, it was like a crepe and it was it was brown and a bit crispy, but mm -hmm. delicious all the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, another question from Sam. He says the oak trees in my area are a bit stunted. Is it still worth processing smaller acorns? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure it's a little bit more frustrating. It is very satisfying to work with these enormous acorns we have here, and it's not nearly as much labor. Um, but you know, you'll have to, you'll have to process some and taste it and see if it's worth it to you. You're, you're the only one that can, can really answer that question. I've tasted wonderful acorns that were small, uh, you know, but they ended up making a fabulous flower. That's another thing that, um, you see in my book is I have three different acorn flowers on a table. You can see the different color. Um, one is almost a brick red and the other one is a dark beige and the other one is a, a creamy color. So whatever acorns you have are going to be very unique and, and you'll have to find out if it, if it is worth it for you. Okay. So Andy's got a bit of a curiosity question. He says, why do squirrels bury them? Is it to ensure a steady leaching process to remove the tannins or are they just being greedy? <laughs> Does anyone even know? I yeah, I can't speak to that. I would. I, I definitely. That's not my field of expertise. But it, it sounds reasonable. You know, it it sounds reasonable. Uh, crows, uh, jays, and um, and other birds that have um, evolved to to carry as many as three acorns in their gullet also bury them and often forget about them. Okay. And I doubt that the birds are burying them for for leaching reasons so who knows yeah who knows one of the great mysteries of life isn't it <laughs> we'll get there eventually maybe and who cares does it matter really so amanda asks i would like to know if the edibility extends to all oaks we've already answered that question okay. yes all oak acorns are edible providing you process them correctly, which we're going to be getting on to. So Marilyn asks, what kind of drinks can you make with acorns? Is it just the coffee or is there anything else? Okay, well, yeah. Um, the I, the um, area of Extremadura, which is a peninsula between Spain and Portugal, which has a, a somewhat of an acorn-based economy. Um, they do the acorn-fed uh, jamon ham, but they also um, do some artisanal products, and one of them is an acorn liqueur, um, 
it's very tasty. And uh, I believe they they just put raw acorn into distilled alcohol and let it soak for many, many months. I cheat and I, when I leach the acorns, I save some of the water off of the first leach, uh, which is very, very, very dark, almost chocolate brown with tannins. I boil it down into a syrup and then I add a couple of drops of that into vodka or um, the other drink that we drink here in Greece, uh, raki tsipuro, and it gives it a really interesting flavor and um, an aroma and color. Um, just on a side note, uh, Absolute Vodka actually came out with a, an oak vodka, which was absolutely delicious last year. Wow. Uh, okay. As for the coffee, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later because I think there's another question about coffee specifically. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, just, just something popped in about coursing because you're using the first um, uh, soaking. So the, it's very, very high tanning content. So concerning tannins impacting kidneys, in a bottle what? of vodka, say, what? how many tablespoons would that be? No, or milliliters, no, do you think? One teaspoon in one, a bottle of vodka. One teaspoon, okay, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, so yeah. there's no, there. yeah, I'm not worried about that, yeah. Yeah. But um, again, I mean, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't drink a bottle of that in a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did in my past. <laughs> I don't drink alcohol, so I've got a bit of a history with it, which is why I don't. Um, okay. But hey, any of you that do, and I know a lot of you really like your wild booze, go for I, it. <laughs> but I have I have that recipe in the in the cookbook. I've I've added something with um with the the acorn vodka as well as the grubs. When we're harvesting acorns, um, some years there's a certain amount of grubs that come out during the processing. And uh, I found that you can pop them like popcorn, and they're really, really tasty. Wow. Okay. Sorry, vegans. That one's just made you throw up. But um, oh, I'm, I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm big into grubs myself. So that's interesting that we can eat acorn grubs. Oh, mm. absolutely. And they've been in the acorn their whole lives eating pure acorns. So they're so clean, and they are so tasty. Wow. So how would you cook the grubs? I just uh, get a skillet and um, and yeah. with a bit of either oil or butter, just a bit though. I um, saute a, gar a garlic glow, cloves, excuse me, just to flavor the skillet a bit. Um, even a little bit of rock salt can go in there, and then I just throw them in, and they they just blow up and pop like popcorn. <laughs> I can Sorry. I can see Fergus Drennan getting onto this one. His next video on Instagram is going to be him eating acorn grubs. I love it. I love it. That, <laughs> there you go, Fergus. Um, you're, you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So Tracy says, what is the modern use of acorns as an alternative food source to compensate for imported foods? Sorry, what is the best modern use of acorns? Well, flour, I suppose, really. I think it's the easiest to store, um, uh, but for the home, uh, for the person who's doing this at home, I think the easiest way is to process your acorns, um, either in a granular um, form or in slices, and then freeze them. Freeze them in, in portion sizes, and then when you're cooking, you can just pull a bag out and add it. If you don't want to go through the entire process of drying it out and milling it, you can you can cut out two of the steps like that. Okay, great. So we're moving on to the removal of tannins. We've got a number of questions. Uh, the first one's from Colin, who says, "What is the best way?" So we're not talking industrial level. We're not talking at the level you're doing it. We're talking for home home use, people at mm -hmm. home. What is the best way to remove the tannins? Can we use a stream like our forefathers did? Well, our forefathers had cleaner streams than we do. Sure. So you have to be really careful about anything you do in any stream. You have to know exactly what's going on upstream, and that's almost impossible during this day and age. Yeah. So, you know, that that's a whole different, I, you know, that's something I can't really speak to. That You'll have to use your judgment. But, but um, uh, hypothetically speaking, yes, you can put them in a net bag either in or out of the shell, and have them in uh, running water. Um, the easiest way to do it at home, I think, is shell them and put them in vats of water. The water does not need to be moving. 
the tannin that's coming out of the acorns basically keeps the water fresh. You won't get uh, mold growth or anything like that. So if you change the water once a day or change half or a quarter of the water once a day, that should be sufficient. I've also found that no matter how dark the water's getting from the leaching process, the acorns continue to leach even in very dark water. So it's a misconcept that you have to just keep changing the water. I, I don't change the water much at all. Really? So, I mean, my, the way that I've, I've leached in the past is to put them in a bucket with the shells on, pour hot water on, wait 24 hours, then shell them, then put, then put them back into the bucket and for the next five or so days, pour hot water, just hot water on in the morning, strain it off the next day, more hot water. So I don't actually need to do that. I can just keep them in the bucket in cold yeah, water. You don't, you don't want to put hot water on acorns ever in any state. Um, wow. it really, it really saps them of their nutrients and it also kind of slows down the leaching process. So if you're in a hurry and you came in, came in from outdoors with a bucket of acorns and you wanted to cook them that moment, then yes, you could do some boiling water leeches and get them, get them edible within, you know, half hour, but you would never, um, you never, if you are going to use hot water, you need to continue continue with hot water as as you pour off one um one load of water and add another one you need to add hot water otherwise if you go from hot to cold and back again you're essentially locking the tannins in okay um and as far as um yeah you need to get them out of their shells probably before you start the leaching process otherwise you're just leaching the shells for no reason it's just you're just adding time to the process so you mean you mean you mean by that you mean actually shell them before you use the cold water leaching method as well as the hot water leaching method i would never use hot water on acorns in no any but way. just what you just said about if you're in a hurry <laughs> right yes so so basically yeah you want to take the shells off in order to get the shells off you might leave them to dry outside in the sun or in the air and then as they dry out a bit in their shells there's a bit of space between the shell and the nut itself and they're easier to to crack open okay so i think we've quest the questions coming on later but i'm going to ask it now do the acorns have to be brown or can we gather them when they're green uh, uh, I would only ever gather green acorns. So as they as they ripen and they become brown, there's just more and more chance that they're going to be infested by something. There's many different things that, that can get at your acorns. So I prefer to net the trees, and this is the way it's traditionally been done in Greece for, for centuries. Net the trees and, and then you tap at the branches and the acorns fall out green. And then those green acorns are brought to a specific place where insects can't get at them, where they can naturally dry out, ripen and dry out, but off of the tree. So when you dry them out, I'm take, I mean, I'm just saying for people who've never done this before, that you put them on a, in a single level. So like lay them on a, on a drying sheet in a, in, a, mm -hmm. in a container. You don't put them in a bag and just let them sit because that's going to create moisture and mold, Absolutely. I would imagine. To be, they need to be left out, um, if possible, uh, either on a wooden deck where that can absorb some moisture or either or on a rack that's above ground. And then they need to be covered up in the evening if there's a lot of precipitation. What's so that's, precipitation that's, mean? If, if there's a lot of, if there's a lot of moisture in the air. Okay. So um, I have a, a specific table, which is 50 square meters of space that um that i dry it's above ground so there's no problem with rodents and that helps me to dry them in the sun without um, having any problems with uh, yeah infestation of rodents so to get to get say 500 grams of acorn flour how many acorns how many kilos of acorns would you need to gather it's about one to four so about four for about two kilos for 500 grams you lose a lot of weight uh, as the acorn dries out, so you lose it moisture. You lose a lot of weight with the shell, you know, 20, 25% with the shell. You lose some with the uh, acorn that's not suitable, that is, has to be discarded. So it's about one to four, which is why it's expensive. It's uh, Acorn flour is going to remain expensive until we can get 
the process, you know, until we can get the quantities a little bit higher than we they are now. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we're going to get into the nutrition of, of you know, why, mm-hmm. why use it. But there's another question here from Fergus, who I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. If leaching in streams and rivers, which obviously <clears throat> we don't really advise because of the what you've just said about there's no wild water anymore. Uh, right. Do you do that with the shells on or off? So you've just said you do it with them off. Yes, um, and I have, Fergus, I think, was also interested in leaching acorns in the sea, and I have tried that, and in that case, I put them in their shells, because I felt they would need the protection, you know, so I put them in net bags in their shells, and I hung them off of buoys uh, some ways out in a clean part of the sea, Uh, well, the sea's very clean here, but in a place where I knew boats wouldn't be passing and things. Yeah. Um, excellent results, amazing results. I, I liked the way the salt tasted as well in mm. the nut. But um, because I have a business based on acorn flour, there was no way that I could certify sea leached uh, acorn flour because, you know, their main question is, you know, what sea, where, how can we, how sure. can we regulate this? So, but for somebody who's doing this near the sea, I think it's a great, uh, a great idea. And if they're in the shell, you won't have to worry about some sea creatures eating them. Yeah. So how long would you leave them in the ocean, in the sea for? I'd probably leave them at least a week. I mean, again, that's going to depend on the acorn and and, and uh, how long it takes. Uh, white white acorns, which are more common in um, Great Britain, uh, are tend to take about a week in water. Okay. So just to, to clarify with the leaching, there's no need to kind of put a slit in the shell or anything like that before <clears throat> you leach. You just put them in whole. Again, we're talking about in the sea. Otherwise, if you're leaching them at home, oh, yeah. fresh water, I say get the shells off. Yeah. Get the shells off, discard them, use them as mulch. Uh, but uh, yeah, don't. You're just adding more tannin into the into the process. You can eliminate that from the beginning, and that's one step in the oh, right yeah. direction. So if you are leaching them in the shell in the sea, you don't mm-hmm. need to put a slit in them. To I don't think so. No, no. No. Okay. Great. Okay, can acorns be stored unprocessed? Yes, Af- acorns after should leaching. Be I'm assuming that says that means. Well, I know um, acorns should be stored unleached. Okay, now, that's the secret because the tannin is a natural preservative. So, um, so the secret to storing acorns long term is to get them very, very dry, so they rattle like beads in the shells, and then store them in the shells. Uh, somewhere in a place where rodents and uh, insects can't get at them. Everything will try to get them in storage. They smell so good. Everything will try to break (laughs) into your storage and steal your acorns. So I've tried everything. I've even sealed them in bags, which I didn't like, but I have these plastic bags that are reusable. Um, the, the, but as long as they're, if they're in the shell and they're, and they're hard like beads, they have a much, much higher chance of being okay for a very long time. So once they're really dry, like you say, they're rattling around like a like a a, a bead. Mm-hmm. Can they could they be stored in in like um big five liter five gallon buckets with a yep. airtight lid? Absolutely, that's the best way. A nice a nice um, stainless steel vat with a tight lid and a, a big big mouth at the bottom that you could just open up and pour them into a bucket. That's the ideal. Wonderful. Uh, Debbie asks, are damaged acorns still okay? Well. No. Um, it depends what they're damaged with. I mean, the, the weevil, the, I'm sorry, the grubs uh, will um, go in and out and they'll leave a nice channel through the acorn. But, you know, by the time they've been processed, they're rinsed so many times that doesn't really bother me. Um, there are also very small um moth-like creatures, I'm not exactly sure what they are, what the name is, that will come in and bore through the acorns and turn uh, acorns that are in storage, even if they've been dried properly, they'll turn them into dust within days. Wow. So, yeah. But no, I mean, if if an acorn doesn't look good, you don't want to eat it. That's what I always tell the people that are helping me sort. You know, just imagine this is food. (laughs) And if it doesn't look like something you want to eat, then throw it away. Yeah, I find that actually quite a lot on my day courses when we go gathering is that we're so pr- 
programmed by supermarket food. So in really? botany, there's this term plant blindness, which is why people don't see plants. They just see a green wall, a green haze. And it's almost like there's a there's a super there's a there's a almost supermarket blindness in the sense that that when people have gone out gathering, they will bring back food that basically should have come out of the bottom of a compost bin. And I, and I say to people, I say, would, you know, would you would you really genuinely want to eat this? And, and why go for brown, mottled, old plant matter when there's fresh, young, vibrant greenness? But but people's cognitive filters literally can't see they are plant blind. They can't see the difference between a healthy plant and one that should be in the compost bin. Interesting. And, it, and foraging does retrain you in your kind of perceptions of being able to discern healthy versus kind of definitely gone past its best to pick date. Mm. Okay, we've got a question here from Teresa, um, or Teresa. She says, can I roast and eat acorns roasted in aluminium foil in a fire? Will the roasting take the tannins out? Uh, Not if they're in aluminum foil, but if you put them in their shells in the ashes of a nice fire in the in the coals, they will that that is one method of of leaching acorns. I don't have personal experience with that, but I have talked to lots of the old timers here on the island that ate acorns during the Second World War and the Civil War after that here in Greece. Um, And the way that they they generally ate them was by putting them in the ashes in the fireplace and and getting rid of some of the tannins like that. I've also found, I know it's going to probably make a lot of people's heads spin here, but microwave, microwaving acorns also de- takes the leeches, um, leeches the tannins out very quickly. I don't use a microwave. I don't own a microwave, but I did do some experimentation with it, and it's it's quite interesting how easy it is to get the tannins out with a microwave. How long would you be microwaving them for and what kind of temperature can you remember yeah of course it's called microwave um, aided extraction it's in my book and oh, right. uh, okay um you basically rinse them out like normal and um, leach them like normal and then the wet mash you put on a paper towel in the microwave for about 30 or 40 seconds and then you uh break it up a little bit turn it over another 30 40 seconds and that's it it's ready to go wow that's pretty quick that's really quick <laughs> Okay, so question from Fiona. How do I make coffee with acorns? Well, that's an interesting question because what they call acorn coffee, I would never call coffee. It's good, but it's not coffee. And I think it it did more to... um, to ruin the reputation of acorns than to help it when people started being aware of acorn coffee. And I guess during the World War II, again, they used acorns as a substitute for coffee. I'd call it an infusion. I'd call it a tea, but it really doesn't taste like coffee. Um, all you do is is uh, brew some, some acorn flour in a hot cup of water. Um, I have a product that I call Nutac. It's kind of a cheeky name. It's from nut and acorn, Nutac. And it's uh, acorn flour, 45%, um, damarara sugar, and very high-quality cocoa. And it's just a powder drink, like an Ovaltine-type drink, that you take one one heaping tablespoon in a hot cup of milk or water or nut milk. And um, you get kind of a – it's thicker than coffee. That's why I wouldn't call acorn coffee coffee because it has more of a thick – texture and consistency than coffee does but very very filling and very very nutritive so we would most probably call that word silky has a silky texture to it that's good but in answer to um in answer to the actual question how to make acorn coffee you just take one of those paper filters put a couple heaping teaspoons of acorn flour into the into the filter and and drain strain some hot water over it and you'll get a hot, dark um, beverage. If it's if you're using acorn flour, then you won't have any fear of, of tannic poisoning. If you did that with fresh acorns, you know, you'd just be drinking straight tannin, which isn't a good idea. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, have you tried roasting the flour or baking the flour first before you put it into the coffee filter? Have you noticed any difference there? I have, and it's definitely much tastier. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, Debs asks, over the past couple of years, I have noticed disfigured acorns on trees. Why is this happening? I should know the answer to this question, but I don't. Okay. Uh, is it some form I, of gall, I think, isn't it? It's probably gall and weather, or and or weather, yeah. yeah. It pro- it's not, I don't think it has anything to do with anything inherently wrong with the tree. It's conditions. Yeah question here from me that said how long will acorn flower keep and what is the best way to store it we've discussed storing acorns but the actual flower itself if if you know when i buy flour from you is that going to last six months before it goes rancid or what no it'll last up to two years if you keep it in a cool dry place it'll last up to two years um i that's that's uh, there's no question about that of course um if it gets too hot or if it gets in direct sunlight, it'll shorten the life. But you want to keep it in an airtight bag in a dark cupboard and it should be fine for a long time. Or, you know, I also keep my flower in the freezer. Um, after this much work, uh, before, you know, to, before it's actually become flower, there's so much work involved that by the time I get it to the flower um, state, I freeze it in very large bags before it, it gets individually packed and, and sold. So, but that's because we have walk-in freezers here anyway for the for the production line. If I didn't have walk-in freezers, that would be a different story. Yeah. On to the nutritional aspects of using acorns. What is their nutrition? I mean, are they are they high protein, high carb? Are they high protein, low carb? High carb, low protein. What about the minerals, etc.? Can you just give us a kind of overview on on the nutrient density of this? Pretty extraordinary food. Absolutely. They're not particularly high protein um, any more than any other nuts. Uh, they're lower protein than almonds and, and walnut, but they are high carb. They're extremely high in trace minerals, in magnesium, in potassium, and in polyphenols. And, uh, you know, I just gave a TED Talk recently, a few months ago, which you can find on, on YouTube. And in the TED Talk, I say that... Um, a lot of people know that polyphenol is a good thing, but they're not quite sure what it is. And basically, those are antioxidant um, cells that go after, they, they seek, search for, and go after sick cells, cancerous cells, and they eat them. They eradicate them. So you want a diet rich in polyphenols, and they're harder and harder to find in, in this processed world. And acorns are extraordinarily high in them. Anybody who has analyzed my acorn flower has been very surprised by wow. that. Well, so... Po- um- are polyphenols the same things you get in things like bilberries and blueberries? Exactly, and gochi, and yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. So one of the things that I found delightful in your book was a thing you call, it was under community activities. And so I've always say on my courses and um, when I talk to people that foraging can be a solo practice you know kind of a meditation just time out for yourself but ultimately we did it as groups in tribes and bands and you have this wonderful concept of called sorting sundays which could you just tell us a little bit more about that because i think if communities locally around britain and i really encourage anyone who listens to this you know don't wait for someone else to do stuff for you you got to just go out and, and and make it happen yourself and I just envisioned when I saw that word sorting Sundays, you know, can you imagine if the shops weren't open on Sundays and we got together as communities and went acorn gathering and then we dried and processed it? It just seemed really delightful, actually. I'm just old school, really, I think. But what what is sorting Sundays? What do you do? What do you get up to? It's delightful. It's a way that a, a lot of people can get involved as well that don't have the time to come out with us and actually do the harvesting. So during the month of October, um, I invite volunteers to come and help harvest, um, and and that involves you know uh, six to seven hours of work per day. Uh, we net the trees and whack the acorns out, and a lot of hauling. It's it's hard work, um, but we we have a work exchange. You stay here for free in a very very luxurious guest house, and you get um, all your food. So you have no expenses while you're here. Um, I have hundreds of applications every year, and so it gets filled up quite quite quickly. And um, what the volunteers have the day off on Sunday. And that was, I found a, a good chance to kind of get ahead of the game because the acorns that are coming in, we're collecting both the caps and the acorns. 
Um, anybody who wants to see what that looks like can see on our site. They're very, very large acorns and very, very large caps. And the caps are exported for the leather tanning industry. It's a whole separate thing. So they need to be separated. Plus, the, of course, the acorns that are damaged needs to be need to be separated out. And it's just it's just a labor intensive thing that needs lots of hands. And it's a lot of fun. So anybody who wants to come on Sunday can come help us sort. And um, everybody gets, you know, acorn cookies. And it is all about community. And, and the big changes that need to happen in this transition time are going to happen in very small groups. It's going to start in groups of three, four, five, ten people. Yeah, I agree. And it would be lovely to have a celebration, an acorn festival every year around Britain. The harvest time, uh, you, you mentioned October. I've seen deliciously huge acorns recently and we're only kind of where are we now we're in the mid September so kind of like mid onwards and when when does it kind of when do you stop gathering and harvesting I mean is it kind of December it's, or it's variable but we could we could start we have started at the end of September but you know the more the more years I do this the better I get at it and and the shorter the gathering season actually is so what used to take me six weeks to gather now takes me 10 days. Yeah. Because I just, I'm, first of all, I, I've also am uh, interacting with trees regularly. So I know what to expect and many different factors. Um, uh, just a word about the acorn festival. I have hosted an acorn festival. This will be the ninth year. Um, it's, it started out as just a group of friends and literally 10 people. I think we were at the first one. And now we have hundreds of people and it's advertised on the radio here in Greece and people come over for the day. And it's a very, very simple grassroots festival. It's not at all fancy. It's uh, just about celebrating the trees and uh, the people that live around the trees and the acorns. And we do games for kids. And it's kind of a it's a kind of a cultural indoctrination, if you will, because, you know, the idea is just to celebrate this thing and, and, and make it fun. Yeah, wonderful. So uh, obviously you just keep gathering your acorns while they're green and when they start going brown, that's when it's finished. Well, that's yes. If I'm if I'm very short on acorn, we continue until they're brown and it just involves a lot more sorting because by then, by the time they hit the ground, they get infested by beetles. Um, uh, the other thing is you don't want to collect the very first um, acorns that fall because in the beginning of the season, you'll get one fall of acorns and they'll be quite brown as well, quite early on. And those will surely be infested. And that is why they've fallen so early. You ignore those, leave those for the wildlife. And then um, and then you you net over them, basically, and and collect the other ones. The other thing is the acorns at the top of a tree on the crown of a tree will definitely be the least infested if you've got an infestation problem. Yeah. So we don't send our kids up the chimneys anymore. We're going to be sending them up acorn um, oak trees. <laughs> For them. Climbing trees is, is very good. If you are interested in getting a copy of Marcy's book, which I highly recommend. She is so knowledgeable, one of the top people in Europe on who who has worked and processed and worked with acorns, as she has already said, for a very, very long time. You can pick up a copy of her book. You can get a bag of acorn flour, cold pressed. You get a fruit chew and you get free shipping. And shipping is expensive normally. So if you go to eatweeds.co.uk forward slash oak meal, oak and then meal as in a meal that you sit down and eat, uh, you'll find the link to the offer. There's a coupon code that you need to use, which is just simply eat weeds. Um, yeah. Is there anything else, Marcy, that you would like to share with the listeners about acorns oak anything inspirational anything that we haven't covered well um one thing that i think is very interesting and and i think the more people that know about eating acorns the more likely this information will get into the right hands is that um with their tannins intact in their shells acorns can stay a viable food source for up to a decade in storage and this could have some really um very important um benefits for places uh, that are experiencing famine or war zones, um, refugee areas. 
because uh, here in Greece, I'm very aware of what's happening east of us in the eastern Mediterranean, where there are many, many dense or oak forests, and really nobody's aware that they can be eating the fruit of the oak. So it's been wonderful having you on. You've been very, very generous with sharing your knowledge. And all the links to reach out and connect with Marcy will be in the show notes and uh, the podcast section on eatweeds.co.uk, including the special offer. So once again, really great to have you. What time of year is your festival if people wanted to come over? Because I'm certainly intrigued to actually come over. The festival will be, we have a three-day weekend at the end of October in Greece every year. And it's uh, quite, it's a time when people who have second homes uh, come here to kind of close the homes up for the winter. So we've got an audience, um, as well as, of course, our local stakeholders. So it'll be on Sunday, the 27th um, of October. And it's during the day. It starts out at 11 in the morning with an oak walk with myself and a professor from one of the universities here in Greece who is an expert, um, a European recognized expert on oak trees. And so we're going to have a, a couple hour oak walk with whoever wants to come along and learn a little bit more. And then uh, and then the party starts, oak foods and live music and some local producers and just a kind of a fun grassroots party. Wonderful. Nothing. I love grassroots <laughs> gatherings and festivals. They are the best. Like you say, there's nothing fancy about them. It's about the people and the practices that we happen to be doing. So thank you for having you- me. It's a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a joy. So will will the festival be on in 2020 as well? Uh, yeah, I, I, I assume so. Yeah. Great. I've and been hosting it for nine years now. Great. So do you, do you, is there somewhere on your website that people can sign up to a mailing list and that kind of thing to be kept, kept uh, up to date? There, there is. There's an easy way to contact me through the, through the site. So the Oak Meal site is the best way to contact me. Yeah, great. Okay, links in the show notes. So thanks, Glenn. Cheerio, Marcy.